BI or Die, the podcast by Reporting Impulse about Analytics, Dashboards and Business Intelligence. Hello everybody, this is Kai from Reporting Impulse with another episode of our podcast BI or Die. Also joining me today is my dear co-host Victoria. Hi Victoria, how are you? Hello Kai, I'm fine. I'm looking forward to this episode and our new guest today. Yeah, we have a very, very special pleasure of having a wonderful guest with us today. Uh, it's Jack. Very warm welcome, Jack. Hello. Hello. Thanks for inviting me. I'm curious how it's going to play out and I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, you work as head of data science for MSD, uh, Merck, Sharp and Dome. Uh, if I first heard this approbation, it didn't mean anything to me, to be honest. Um, but Victoria, was that uh, immediately clear to you or... As, as we do quite a lot in the pharma industry, I, I, it makes something in my mind and I knew what it is. So MSD was, was a, a name for me, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm probably the only person uh, on this podcast who needs to catch up uh, with the pharma industry. So luckily that we have Jack today here. But nevertheless, uh, would you like to tell a little bit about how we get to know each other or how do you get to know Reporting Impulse? Well, I think we, we met a few times at the different events, at some fireside chats in a different uh, settings. And at the end, uh, we actually got to know even better each other through a, through a session, through a workshop on data visualization, on defining information design, defining dashboarding structures, approaches, and also uh, what's the best approach for advanced visualization so which was a great workshop that's how we got to know each other even more that, that's true for me, for me the, the first contact point i think was more or less this uh, the fireside thing you mentioned so the, the leader circle uh, at the moment there's less fires uh, side it's more or less than yeah, a virtual connection or platform to to discuss topics around uh, data analytics bi with other leaders in in this sector and yeah, I, I really like that. I really appreciate that. And the thing what particularly impressed me um, that I got to know that you had once a face-to-face -face training with, with Edward Tufty. And uh, I'm still very impressed about that. And I definitely wanted to ask you this during this podcast, because maybe just to put that in, in perspective uh, from, from my view, um, I mean, they're very well-known pers personalities in dashboard and information design. But above all, I think, there's always Edward Tufty. Uh, he floats, I think, uh, probably around all of those uh, figures. He coined this this term of uh, data uh, chart chunk and how to transform it in meaningful data. Um, there's also, he's more or less the inventor of the spark lines. Uh, the data ink ratio thing is also kind of his, his idea. Uh, but you, you attended really a, a seminar. I only had the chance to read the book. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. What was it uh, to, to meet at, and maybe you can share some insights. Yeah, so, so this was a big event. So it's not like I was like, um, Ed and I are the best buddies. Uh, <laughs> but uh, actually, I got to know uh, Tafti through his first book many, many years ago. And back when I was working at HP, we had uh, really, we got into the, the idea on how to best visualize uh, what we analyze. And uh, then when Tafti does these seminars in um, many U.S. cities, and, and I, when I saw that he was in town, that was in Portland, Oregon, I just grabbed a couple of uh, my colleagues and we went to the seminar. This is, I don't know, maybe 100, 150 people. And, and Tafti was just, just presenting his, his typical things like how he communicates something through a PowerPoint. Uh, or how you do it actually the be better way. And then you got his books as a as part of the package. And then I did the same uh, probably a year later, or maybe two two years later with another team, which were was even more interesting because I got even more people to go with me. We were a group of 15 people from HP. So it was interesting to see the, uh, just to see here directly from him, 
in addition to to reading reading his books yeah i could definitely imagine that is a really lifetime experience especially after looking at all the success you have and how famous how how many people's or how many books quote from him so that's definitely a lifetime experience i would say and and saying it from from its own words saying okay powerpoint is evil or some of these famous quotes so that's really really cool um, that you, that you shared this experience with us. But beside that, we also have some some uh, two or three, I think, Victoria, personal questions to also get uh, yeah. beyond that uh, more or less business talk here. <laughs> yeah, we want to go, go and get to know the private uh, Jack a little bit more. Just three questions, and um, I'm sure it's easy for you. <laughs> so three qualities that make you as a person. Oh, uh, three qualities that make me as a person. Um, I'm curious. I ask questions. And uh, my my parents, when I was little, had to answer many questions, and and they supported that. So so I keep <laughs> I kept asking questions. So being curious is uh, being uh, looking for how to do things better, how to think outside of a box. Is, uh, is I think what what I would say uh, has been true uh, has been true throughout my my career for sure um pr persistence so it, persistence in the sense that if i believe in something i'll 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 go for it there is i mean you can have some ideas and they sound great but if you just talk about them and don't take action on them that they just uh, just ideas so there was a quote uh, i think uh, if, A dream without a goal is just just a dream. Probably I'm incorrectly quoting this, but basically it's a, if you have a vision, if you have a dream, go for it. That that's what I uh, what I do. And then the third one is I'm not afraid of failure. And uh, so I, tr I tried two startups uh, in the past, and uh, who were not that successful, but I learned so much doing those. So. And sometimes I, I do, even in larger companies, I try something that will be maybe a failure, but uh, that's where you learn the most. Yeah, so. it's perfect. I, I think it's great, uh, especially what you said last. I think it's um, something that huge companies need at uh, the time today. And it's missing often in huge companies that people are stuck in their thinking, in their tr company structure, which is, which is quite um, forced or hard. And um, and they are not uh, have the, yeah, the power or the... yeah. Yeah, the feeling that they could um, change something and that they could, that's okay to fail. And I think that um, makes even uh, especially big companies better having people like you trying it, um, doing it, uh, being motivated. Great. So next question. What's your biggest hobby? Biggest hobby? <laughs> well, I like to bike, but I wouldn't say biggest hobby. I think I uh, don't have a biggest hobby. I have a few smaller hobbies. Biking is, is one, uh, traveling is another one, unfortunately. <laughs> past, difficult right now. <laughs> past 12 months or past 10 months, we're not, we're not, we're not that uh, supporting my my hobby. And the other one, I I, I like to invest. And, and that kind of a, is, is uh, I mean, still that requires spending time in front of a computer, but it, it requires also to look at outside of the box. So I'm not investing in companies uh, or stocks. I'm investing in trends. So, so like the trend of gaming that potentially is now reaching some some plateau, or or in the investments in e-commerce that that's still huge, particularly in in the, in the emerging markets, or or the trend in in leveraging data, and that's because that's also what I've been doing for the past 20 plus years. It's uh, It's, it's a topic that uh, just interests me in general. So, did you bought bitcoins then 10 years ago? Or no, uh, so so bit, I, I myself consider bitcoins a, a more speculative investment. And okay, okay. And it's uh, I'm I'm more investing in trends where where the trends will be in five to 10 years. 
So I'm a long-term investor. But then you invest in stocks to see, or in ETFs, for example, where, where you have these trends sometimes build up, or do you do you, do you really go into companies and invest in companies directly, or I invest directly in companies. Uh, but then, but Great. but but uh, I build a portfolio like. My gaming portfolio is few companies. My e-commerce portfolio is another one. Healthcare is now also one of my new portfolios. But it's uh, I, I I look for some advice and then I select the companies that that I bet will ha be successful in that trend. Yeah, great. You should uh, do an exchange with my husband. He he's doing exactly the same, um, um, and I think it's a really good and interesting way to do this thinking and not investing in uh, yeah in in markets or something, but in trends. It's so really interesting. So, last question: What do you think is, or in your opinion, for you the uh, the best advertising at the moment? Best advertising. <laughs> Completely other. <laughs> Well, um, so I don't watch my, much TV. Um, the 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 advertising I see sometimes um, uh, offline on the streets and and online. Can I you know, can I think of uh, the best advertising today? I, I usually like advertising that that's funny. And uh, so I when I think of advertising the biggest the biggest event to advertise the Super Bowl. And there are always cool ads coming there, and I and then you always get after the Super Bowl, you can always uh, look up online uh, the ads all at once, and and they even ra rate them. So it's uh, oh, I didn't know. Uh, it's it's uh, although I don't like American beer, uh, many times Budweiser, the American Budweiser, had, had good, interesting, funny ads. Uh, great. So we got a, a, a good insight of the private uh, Jack. So thank you for that. In first question, so first real question of our <laughs> five questions, in your LinkedIn profile, um, I, uh, you write a missing link between data and business uh, impact. So really on the top. Where do you where do you see the biggest challenges here? So I, I only recently changed that that statement on my LinkedIn profile. And this was driven by realizing how much there is talk about AI, cloud, big data, omni-channel, all the buzzwords that people are using uh, without actually knowing what's behind this. And, and th this are being thrown around and they are being thrown around by different people. On one hand, you have consulting companies throwing this out. Yeah, you need to invest AI, you need to hire us. We have the best AI solution for you. Then within companies, larger companies, IT is, is also using these buzzwords. Yeah, we're developing AI products. Then you have, on the other hand, you have executive CEOs or CIOs who say, yeah, we're going to invest in AI. And what is missing is the kind of the, the link between these passwords and the re reality. So, uh, so that's what I try to, to express in my, my profile, because on one hand, the data volumes, velocity, veracity is growing. It's, and it's, you, it's really become big data in many industries. Now, people talk about data as the new oil, et cetera. I'm, I don't agree with this analogy because it's uh, if you, although to some extent makes sense because if you don't use that data, you can have so much big data, but if you don't use it, it's useless. You need to turn that into insight. You need to extract insight out of that data. And then and that's the first step. And then you need to translate that insight into business impact. You need to use that insight. So what I've been working in the past 20 years in all analytics analytics areas. Back then, this was statistical analysis. Now we call it data science. There are different names for this, but it's basically every time, and, and I learned that actually the hard way maybe 15 years ago when we at HP developed a, a marketing mix model, something relatively new to tech company back then. And this was considered by our colleagues from, from business side uh, as, as kind of a black box. They didn't understand it. They initially were hesitant to use it. And 
it took some time to convince them the value out of that. So, so there is a missing link between data and what you can do with that and what business impact it's going to develop. So, so there is a whole chain, uh, I call it data analytics value chain, where you start with data and then turn that into analysis, into insight, and then the business impact. So that's what I mean, the missing link between data and business impact. And I think based on what I've seen, uh, I, I, I try to close that missing link, close the gap. But I think that's the, the most important, but also most tougher thing to do. Because just talking about that, it's nothing worth. I mean, it's really just an idea thing or a wish list. I would like to have AI and all those or data lakes or whatever, all these buzzwords, but really bringing it down to the basics to see what will be the benefit from our own company. That is what, what really comes the music in, I would say. And, and that's what we like to focus. And But yeah, it's, it's definitely tougher and uh, people need uh, to, to get started and also potentially fail. That, that, that's, that's also, but this is really tough probably in the, in the German culture <laughs> to talk about failure. Uh, but I think we definitely all need to address that. Otherwise, we won't have a true impact on the business. And when we don't have a true impact on the business, yeah, we are not able to, to succeed at the end of the day. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's, that's the, the translation. Uh, I always try to avoid buzzwords, but they are got so established now that it's uh, that I sometimes even use these passwords, although I don't like them, just to ensure that I can translate these passwords into what they really mean, instead of letting them stand alone and people using them without really, uh, really understanding the meaning behind them. And do you know the feeling when you, I, I'm doing the same, I try to avoid these um, passwords, but what sometimes I realize is that people, if they don't hear these passwords, they have the feeling that their solution, AI solution, is not as intelligent as it could be. And um, you use uh, like really old uh, statistical methods. Do you know that feeling or do you know this uh, kind of dis uh, discussion? Yeah, uh, yeah, I do. And, I, and, I, um, and I've seen that in any large companies who hire expensive consulting companies who come with all these passwords. And Usually they are successful in selling the presentation or sometimes a service to to the executives using these passwords. So even though, and that's what I mean, meant just a minute ago, even though I, I would prefer to not use the passwords and really talk about reality, I, I, I need to use these passwords too, just to make sure that when I talk with uh, within uh, HP or within MSD about some specific concepts that they can be kind of associated with maybe what has, has been heard by those consulting companies leveraging these passwords. Yeah, it's, but it's, uh, I, I kind of give up to trying to talk about statistical analysis, I simply call AI, Comes, I think it's uh, that's where I kind of uh, give up and then uh, just go with the flow. Yeah. And I think oh. the second thing is that um, it's um, important that people understand that AI, AI solutions need to grow. That's not like the Big Bang and you have that this intelligence machine that's coming and um, is the solution for all your problems, um, but that um, AI is, 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 is growing. Uh, do you think the same or do you have another opinion about that? Well, so... Um, so uh, um, I'm trying to see how I should put it. The, uh, on one hand, you can think of uh, companies that started using data at the very early stage when they started creating data. So companies that started leveraging data and, and try, try and create insight out of that with statistical analysis, let's say 20 years ago, they grew that organically. They, they, they started, okay, we have an analyst who does the analysis. Okay, now we have more data, potentially we need a data engineer to, to better manage the data sets. Then, then we need to data scientists because we now go deeper in the analysis. We are applying some uh, machine learning models now. Then, and then re they realize, okay, now we have such a big data sets, we need to find a way to visualize it, they adding the visualization capabilities. So 
So there is some companies or industries have grown organically and build this, what I call this data analytics value chain or data village. Now, companies that are new to leveraging data or, or leveraging data to the extent that it's possible to do now, uh, sometimes think, okay, we hire data scientists and they will solve all our problems. They, they forget that they need to have a data engineer who prepares the data. They need to potentially have a data steward who is defining the data sets, who is kind of uh, identifying what data is available, how it's structured, how it's cataloged. And then, then they have also potentially need to connect the analysis into some systems that deliver the analysis to the internal end users, whether it's say so marketing or, or or production or finance. So so sometimes the, the companies come saying, hey, we hire data scientists and it, the problem is solved, but then the data scientists end up data cataloging, data engineering, and then uh, they end up actually using doing jobs that are not data scientist jobs, and then they leave. Because there are other companies who really provide the cool things, the the provide the infrastructure, provide the data sets for the data science to to do the work they're actually interested doing. Uh, so it's kind of longer answer to to your question, but it's yeah we need we need to look at this data village uh, as a as as an approach to address uh, to extract better insight out of data. A particular big data. But that's cool because you already uh, slightly covered at least uh, the second question from our side. And that was, okay, you're head of data science uh, at MSD. Uh, you probably need to build up a team. <laughs> uh, otherwise, it's it's not possible to leverage all the, the insights from the data. Um, so what really makes a good team? And you already mentioned the data scientist, the data engineer. It is also my experience that it's not, I mean, Many of our companies are searching for the so-called unicorn data scientists. And as you said, okay, based on that, everything is solved. But it's definitely not the case that data engineers and maybe the data engineers are even more important uh, than the data scientists, uh, at least in the initial phase. But yeah, what, what, is, what is your approach? How would you uh, set up your your best possible team? Um, so, so I kind of kind of already mentioned this. It's... it's um... It's not only data scientists. It's it's a data village to set up a, a team that can deliver insights, and that that setup will depend on the the company, but also depend on the the function because you potentially you have a different setup to support insight for marketing sales than you would do for finance than you do in a manufacturing production environment but in the end you need to have people who analyze the data whether they call them analysts or scientists you need to have people who prepare the data so usually data engineers then you need also people who And particularly if you have lots of different data assets who understand the different data assets, who who know as a as a as a who know the data catalog, who who are kind of the data owner, who can explain to the data engineer and data scientist what the what that data is, is about, what limitations the data has, where the data is sourced, where um, the different elements of the data set. So so the data engineer or data scientist don't need to spend time understanding the data they got that get this information from the data steward so that's kind of the at the beginning of the data analytics value chain and then if you finish the analysis you need to bring the data to your audience and that's your usually internal customers this is either visualize the outcome in a dashboard uh, whether it's in a standalone whether it's a dashboard that's being refreshed every day every week every month or feed the data into another system that marketing or sales are using, or establish a connection into manufacturing process where, where there is an, uh, with prescriptive analytics, there is a kind of automated adjustment, for example, of the production line based on some quality checks that happened in, uh, in, that, in that system. So again, it's not the analysts, not only the analysts who do the work, but also the, the people who prepare the data, who manage the data, understand the data, but also who feed the outcome into the, 
the system. And would you would you have all the people, so your data village in your department, or is it all over the company? So where where is the break? Because I often discuss this um, with clients. Um, do we have one central um, data science team, or do I have somewhere the cuts between having it centrally and then people outside in the business units? It's it's a question that that it keeps coming up in every company I've been with and in, in every stages of company because it, there is no uh, uh, one fits all answer. I've seen a great some analysis from consulting companies, whether it's McKinsey or whether it's um, research houses or whether it's university like Har Harvard Business Review. They kind of talk about the ideal setup, and there was no. They basically say they there is no ideal setup. It really depends whether the organization is with all the different functions. Do they exist already? How they collaborate? And what's the maturity of the organization being leveraging data? However, particular companies that are new to the setup would be best fit. And this is common, uh, common understanding across many consulting companies too. You should start bringing this all together in one place because uh, other, That way you, you ensure that these people talk with each other. You ensure you avoid any silos. You un ensure that there is no other management priorities that are assigned to a person, a data engineer who sits somewhere else. You have everything in one place and you can coordinate much better the work. You can better develop a data product if you have everybody in one place. And the other thing that I found, based on my experience, I found uh, for sure a critical success factor is that that this data village sits close to the business. It's not part of IT, but it's part of either marketing organization, finance organization, maybe corporate strategy. So it's a it's a, it's a team, it's an analytics team the analytics village that is very close aligned with the business needs instead of being part of IT, which is usually considered, which is usually less involved kind of a, in, in the business decisions. So I really like uh, two, two of those points, uh, especially with the term of it takes a data village. First, the, this statement that it's not a single person like the data scientist who, who's really necessary to to do all that all the leveraging all the data it's the whole team who counts and everything is somehow equally important it starts with the data engineer with the data scientist the data steward but also someone who's been able to talk to to business to to have an understanding of business and stuff like that so that it's the whole team somehow is important and that they are uh, possible to interact and also the thing okay starting centrally first and then doing it more, more or less decentralized because increased activity is always pos po better possible from my point of view as well if uh, it is directly where, where the business impact is. So I really, really like uh, the, those ideas. Um, but we definitely need to continue with, with a question number three. And I know that you don't like all those, those buzzwords and we mentioned uh, some of them already. Uh, and I think, and if you also listen to the, the podcast from Andreas and, and Carsten, uh, the newscast, they introduced data culture as the new password for, for the biggest trends uh, for, for this year. And in this context, I really, really like this, this uh, framework saying, okay, for data culture, there are facilitators, there are enablers. We need to, to structure it, bring just more into context. And one of those enablers are the term data literacy. I know data literacy is also a very uh, known password, um, but it's, again, only about talking what I do at the moment and what I like uh, about you and also what you mentioned right from the beginning. It's really about implementing and doing something. And in that respect, you introduced a data literacy program for more than 1,000 people in your organization. And maybe just a few words about that. Why did you do that? And how did you go about it? So one of the uh, the key, from my point of view, um, there are many, many uh, inhibitors to become a data-driven company. Uh, there is, of course, the data availability. There is the resources to do the analysis. The, there are the, the restrictions, sometimes uh, the legal restrictions, sometimes uh, self-imposed. Sometimes we go a little bit too much in, in uh, being too conservative. 
But the biggest challenge I see at many companies is, is data literacy. So understanding what's possible to do with data, not only looking at the risk associated with using data, but, but looking at the benefits and understanding how data can be used, how data can be turned into insight and, and operationalize that to make some business decisions. But also data literacy plays a role into what systems are used to generate data. So for example, you can use a CRM system, customer relations management system, to send an email to your customer. If that happens, you get information about when the email was sent, if and when was opened, if and when was clicked. You can see what the customer then does on the website after clicking on, on the link. Or you can send email to your customer through Outlook from sales rep to, to customer. That you don't know anything about openings, open rates, click rates. So, and, and the data mindset that needs to be cultivated is to ensure that every employee understands what's possible to do with data and also what systems help us to generate more data and be able to, to get more insights about our customers. So this is particular in a, in, a, in a setting where sales and marketing, where you directly deal with your external customers. And, and that's the reason why um, uh, at MSD, we have started a data literacy program. And, and, and it's many other companies, larger companies uh, have been doing this now recently as well, where you need to think of this as a three, four years investment. It's you cannot train data literacy by sending somebody to a three-day training. So it's a it's a mindset mindset change required, and and which then leads into behavioral change. And it's a long process, so long time horizon. You need to keep in mind, and we divided that into several blocks. One is about reading data. One is about generating data. One is about analyzing data. So. We are at the beginning of, of our journey on that. Great. But you, you're doing, you said it's not a three day training, but you're doing some kind of training, online training, or do you do with more on the job um, training? So we started with a, um, with a learning path. We using dif different, uh, different tools where we define different elements, short videos or, or presentations where our, Colleagues can basically log in and spend half an hour here, half an hour there, going through that training. We are treating this training as a product. So we're trying to improve it based on feedback. We're adding additional elements. So, so that's kind of a learning path. It can be accessed on demand. But we're also doing sessions like, like a, over lunch, presentation on a specific topic, or um, we developing short videos, two minute video on specific data product that we have developed to bring that knowledge for what, what's possible to do with data to a broader audience. And it's, again, we are in early stages. There is many other things we have in our backlog and that so uh, we'll be addressing these over the next um, 12 months. Great. Very cool. So that's pretty much about re and upskilling your, your existing team really to, to the next level, being able to, to, to do all that. What would you say is, um, are the, the biggest potential for the farmer, farmer industry? And what are the, the use cases, which, which are really important in 2021, 20, uh, 22, maybe? So, um, I've been farmer now for three years. The prior 20 plus years I spent in tech industry. Um, and I've been pharma at MSD Germany, which is a marketing sales organization. So, so my focus has been on, on anything related to marketing or selling to uh, end customers. In, in this case, we focus a lot on, on physicians, hospitals, where we look at things, how we can optimize our marketing investments, so marketing mix optimization, how we can better understand our customers, so customer profiling or how we can identify what would be the, the next best activity uh, with uh, Dr. Müller based on what Dr. Müller has, his interests, uh, his preferences, his potentially network, and, and identifying 
based on our business needs, what type of content or what type of communication or what, what type of engagement and when would be best to do with Dr. Muller. So to help Dr. Muller be more efficient in his work, better understanding, of course, our products and, and help Dr. Muller better find a better way to treat patients because at the end, MSD is about saving lives. And this is our core objective. And we do that through providing therapies, through, through providing medicine, to providing uh, vac vaccinations. And we want to ensure that physicians know what we all can offer and they know how can apply what we offer to treat their patients. So, so that's the, the marketing sales part, but there is of course product development, which I'm less involved with, uh, in at, at pharma. But here, and this is true not only for pharma, but but in the meantime, other companies like Google or Apple or, or Amazon who have who are trying to um, to basically go into into this healthcare space by, for example, developing a machine learning approaches to analyze X-rays. To, def to find or to support physicians in identifying uh, uh, lung cancer or breast cancer. So, uh, so this is uh, this is one of the way, uh, uh, areas where AI is helping in the pharma space to, to develop better treatment options and for one, but also to develop better diagnosis for for patients. But there's this, and there are also other competitors in the field, with which then bring more pressure, maybe on the traditional farmer industry, more or less, because you mentioned those Googles and Amazons of this world, and uh, now you still have those, I don't know, double-digit whatever uh, uh, margins and stuff like that. But maybe there's even then a stronger competition, uh, competition from from other fields, from data-driven fields, so that they are also um, engaging your company or the companies in the pharma industry really to, to leverage data much more, right? So there is the pressure definitely, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there is the pressure. There is, uh, and I like that because that's that makes it more dynamic, uh, this entire field. That makes it also pharma companies being more inclined to, to invest in, in data science. I, I wrote in some LinkedIn article way back about Amazon on a Alexa for doctors. So, and, and I expected that, that Amazon at some point in time will, will launch Alexa for doctors where you have a device, uh, the doctor has a device where he or she can get all the information she wants about specific medication, specific treatment. And it's, um, I, th I think that that's where, where it's heading because these tech companies have good understanding, better understanding what's possible to do with data. They have developed data products for years. They know they, how to address customers leveraging data. And it's, uh, this is, uh, I see personally that that's the biggest threat to pharma companies, uh, are these tech companies basically coming with data products. I think that's a good point, and I think it's a good, but it can be a chance for farmers as well to go into joint ventures um, or partnerships, doing it together, because um, tech companies have this tech expertise, but not yet um, as much uh, industry knowledge. And I think um, they have to concentrate then on one or the most, uh, most important for them. And I think when they go in partnerships or joint ventures or whatever, it's, it's, it's really that they, that they can take the, the expertise of both and they take coming for you from the marketing and sales pers perspective, um, the, the um, clients you have already in the farmer industry, for example. So really, really interesting. Coming to our five, fifth question, uh, as we are already really talking a lot with you and liking it, but uh, looking at the time, I think we need a little bit, uh, a short answer. So you already worked, you said it, in different industries, uh, in tech, in pharma. Um, what do you see here in difference in data science level and culture? It's, yeah, it's a big difference across industries, but also a big difference across countries. So the industries is, if I look at, at a, a very simple approach to optimize marketing investments, which is marketing mix optimization. Consumer goods started doing this 20, maybe 25 years ago. 
because they realize it, the, the low profit margins and they need to optimize which products to market and how. And then later on, uh, other industry came on board. So, so tech started do, leveraging this about 15 years ago and then uh, banking. And then later, uh, more like the, the, the healthcare space got into this leveraging data more, more, in more detail. So there is a progression uh, of, of leveraging data, leveraging uh, more advanced analytics that you see across industries, uh, but also you see the differences across markets. So having worked and lived in the US and, and Germany, I see big differences in general between companies in the US and companies in Germany, where you companies in the US are more using data and analytics more relatively speaking than 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 German companies and partly because failure is actually a positive positive thing when it comes to a, how company operates in the US while in Germany it's still it's it's more than it has no negative connotation and and you do lots of failures when you start leveraging data because it's it's never perfect it's um, i've seen some uh, recently comparison between typical it projects and ai projects and ai projects fail more often because there is so much uncertainty what you can do, do with data but if you don't fail you don't learn okay so a cultural thing then which which uh, really ends up or sums up this fifth question so now it only remains basically for us to to say thank you very much uh, for for this session it it was really a really great pleasure to to record this podcast with you uh, i can say i learned a lot about farmer but also about your your thoughts uh, uh, how to to build great teams and really to to bring it on the ground more or less really to be implementing uh, data products and not only talking about that so i really appreciate that and think that also our listeners will highly appreciate those insights and to all listeners out there uh, we are still happy to connect uh, with you on linkedin that goes the same for jack just contact him i think you just got to know him it's quite a nice guy to talk about uh, any topic uh, and of course you can always connect to us uh, recommend other guests or specific topics we should address in our podcast um so i only like to say Bye-bye. You, Victoria, maybe as well. <laughs> Thank you. It was really, really interesting. And it was really good to see uh, having people having um, similar thoughts and um, re really good. Thank you. And now we turn the last words uh, over to, to wonderful Jack now. It's kind of a tradition. Um, yeah, it's your stage. Say whatever you like. Wow. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure to talk. And it's uh, it's it's topics that, I, that uh, I'm passionate about and uh, can talk in a podcast or, or a glass of wine too. Always interesting how that always develops. But so so what I would like then maybe to leave with three, three things. First, build a data village. You're, it, it's more than data scientists. Second, ensure that you build out the data mindset within the company, within the, those who leverage your data. And third, look me up on LinkedIn and then uh, let's talk. Thank you. Thanks for listening to BI or Die, a podcast by Reporting Impulse. If you enjoy our content, please press the like button and subscribe to our podcast so you do not miss another episode. See you next time.